Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar, Applying Experience, Partnering with Pioneers to Deliver Plasma for Discovery Through Commercial Application, presented by Al Debron. I'm Ross Yule, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Our speakers today are Cindy Bifford, Vice President, GMP Nucleic Acids Business Unit at El Devron. Barry Byrne, Associate Chair of Pediatrics and Professor at the University of Florida, the Director at Powell's Gene Therapy Center, and Earl and Christy Powell University Chair in Genetics. And Christine Schaefer, Manufacturing Operations Lead at Spark Therapeutics. You can read their full bios on the left side of your window by selecting the speakers tab. Just a few technical notes before we begin. The webcast is being streamed through your computer, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your volume is up. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand within 24 hours after the event. Time permitting, we will follow the presentations with a Q&A session. Please submit your questions using the questions and answers tab on the left side of your screen. Okay, now let's begin. Cindy, please go ahead. Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today. As mentioned, I'm Cindy Bippert and I'm grateful for the opportunity to share more about Eldebron's plasma services and speak today alongside two scientific and industry experts. I'd like to share information about Eldevron, our plasmid production capabilities, and the desire we have to serve the industry by providing plasmid solutions throughout the life cycle of client programs. Serving clients from their discovery process through commercialization is something we strive to accommodate. To achieve proven successful relationships and partnerships has required us to demonstrate our interest in and ability to collaborate and innovate in countless ways over the last two plus decades. As background information, Aldevron was founded 23 years ago with focus on serving clients who required plasma DNA for research purposes. The organization continues to provide in this area and has since built services to support clients with needs beyond plasma DNA, including the capability to manufacture messenger RNA, proteins, and enzymes at multiple quality grade levels. Over time, we have developed the robust quality systems necessary to support manufacturing of drug products and starting materials used in clinical trials as well as commercial applications. I would also like to highlight that Eldevron has recently built out a regulatory support team which focuses on regulatory submissions and updates, as well as the management of all internal and external audits. This group is highly engaged with our clients and supply suppliers while they continuously are focused on current regulatory intelligence, which is used to evaluate best practice and drive improvements within our organization. Aldebron has experienced rapid growth, for which I've gained an appreciation for in my 19 years with the organization. As you can see on this slide, there was one single recorded gene therapy trial in 1998, the year that Aldebron was founded, to over 1,000 ongoing regenerative medicine and advanced therapy trials worldwide in 2020. This growth has driven our teams to build out critical capacity for all research and GMP services to ensure that we can meet this rising demand. In 2018, we built, commissioned, and opened a new 70,000 square foot GMP facility. And three short years later, in 2021, we've built and opened an additional 189 square foot facility expansion to support GMP manufacturing, testing, product storage, and necessary product stability services. This year, we've also completed construction on a new 45,000 square foot facility to support nucleic acids used for research purposes. And additionally, 21,000 square feet has been built for research grade protein and enzyme production as well. Aldevron is ready to meet demand, but we understand that the importance of continuously preparing for the future to ensure that we have the capacity to deliver is critical. 
This is of great importance as you are engaging with and building relationships with vendors. On this slide, you can see some examples of the number of plasmid lots that have been produced by our team. Experience with this number of constructs, scales, and various quality specification needs has allowed us to understand the importance of balancing attributes such as yield and plasmid stability, and using this knowledge to continuously improve and refine our manufacturing and testing procedures. The experience we've gained has also paved the way for scaling deliverable quantities to well beyond 25 grams per batch when required. Aldevron's technical operations team works closely with our clients and our manufacturing operations team to ensure success, whether with an internal or external tech transfer process. Since my portion of today's time is focused on Aldevron's plasma service, I share the next two slides to showcase major areas of the industry we support with both custom and off-the-shelf plasma products used for viral applications, both in vivo and ex vivo gene and cell therapies. An, an area that will be discussed later during the webinar involves the importance of IPR stability, which our team understands, and that this has refined with our plasma and host screening processes, as well as cell banking and growth optimization. Aldebron has also expanded our experience and capacity over approximately the last eight to 10 years with generation of linear plasma DNA ranging from microgram to 25 plus gram scale used for downstream diagnostic and more commonly mRNA manufacturing purposes. Having the ability to successfully produce batches at wide scales presents challenge. However, our team has navigated this through very prescriptive procedures and proper planning alongside and in collaboration with our clients. I would like to spend a bit of time discussing plasmid manufacturing scale. This slide shows capability to manufacture at small shake glass scale through 300 liter for an upstream production event. It's important for me to point out that our teams understand that one size doesn't fit all end applications, regardless of the product development stage. Therefore, we've deliberately designed both manufacturing processes and infrastructure to allow for flexibility of scale. Aldevron does provide plasmids in either batch deliverable or guaranteed quantity deliverable options in an effort to collaborate and provide the best solution for each unique need. Also of importance is that our downstream plasmid manufacturing processes are not limited to the volume of product harvested from a single fermentation. Our procedures typically allow for pooling and generation of large quantity deliverables beyond what may be produced during a single upstream event based on scales noted in this slide. Overarching the manufacturing of product is our commitment to quality. I can't express enough how our leadership and associates understand that this commitment is critical to the, the success both within Aldevron and of course for our clients. Aldevron's quality system governs all aspects of our GMP source and GMP services, both of which have been built and designed in collaboration with clients, whether we were manufacturing critical raw materials or starting materials to support early phase clinical trials or later development and commercial needs. We continue to refine our policies and processes through collaborative engagement, and one important way it utilizes our audit process, both internal audit and external with suppliers, vendors, and our clients, of course, inspecting our facility and policy and procedures as well. On this slide, we show four areas depicted as Aldebaran's quality ecosystem. From our quality control department from its responsibility focused on method development and validation, product release testing, product stability testing, as well as all environmental monitoring to our quality assurance, inclusive of incoming quality assurance, operational quality assurance, quality systems, quality release, document control, and our quality technology teams. We have experience and proper focus to ensure we meet our commitment to quality. Another facet I will mention is continuous improvement. Whether team members are working toward process improvement, CAPA effectiveness, Kaizen initiatives, 
or innovation. Continuous improvement is a significant focus for every team member within our organization. Lastly, as I mentioned earlier, we also have a focused regulatory team to support regulatory filings, audits, and other consultative services. This slide shows a few photos of Aldebaran's completed GMP facility, which opened this year. The facility is commissioned and fully operational, and this is the location where we would host inspections. As you can see, this slide shows a biologics map depicting the interconnected nature of key steps in the drug development life cycle for biologics. I share this as we realize the complexity associated with the work involved for our clients bringing new therapies to patients is especially true in an expedited effort. Our goal, goals include wanting to really ensure that procuring plasma DNA from us is not adding complexity, challenge, or inefficiency to our clients' processes. Our approach of ensuring continuity from research grade through GMP services allows for standardization and utilization of platform production processes, an effort to streamline and reduce risks to developing programs. In order for Aldebaran to simplify the process of delivering plasma DNA by ensuring material continuity and consistency, we recommend developing a strong plan for plasma needs at early stages of candidate development and partnering closely with a team to consider all stages from discovery through commercialization. Our team can help support and guide by informing clients of the specifics associated with research grade, GMP source, and GMP service offerings, and how these services can complement the evolution of developing programs with research-grade services designed to meet needs during discovery, GMP source to support usually toxicology and early-stage clinical work, and GMP services that typically are used to supply plasmid starting materials for later phase and commercial needs. This concludes my portion of the presentation. Thank you again for taking the time to listen, and I look forward to questions after our next two speakers present. At this time, I will hand it over to Dr. Barry Byrne. Thanks very much, Cindy. Um, let's uh, begin the next section, which uh, is regard to vector design considerations. And um, I'm going to give a little bit of background here and then dive into some specifics, particularly around ITR stability. Um, it's important to emphasize that planning for successful AV manufacturing starts with the raw materials. And this is the role that Aldebaran plays in providing high quality plasma raw materials when the triple transfection process is used, or, or in some cases, it's possible to combine to the helper plasma to provide the accessory functions and the rev cap into a single plasma, so a double transfection approach. But often we consider this to be a straightforward path, but um, there are many pitfalls that I'll address and uh, hopefully can be avoided by understanding some of the fundamentals. So the basis for rate manufacturing of AV vectors is derived from the um, finding that the only required cis-acting elements of the AV genome that are needed in construction of a vector are the inverted terminal repeats. These are unique 145 base pair structures that are at the termini of AV. And one of the innovations of the <clears throat> by um, at the University of Florida, actually, by Jude Zamolski and Ken Burns and Nick Zisco, were to um, isolate the AV genome into a plasmid, which was the basis for all the subsequent um, vector generate, generated in this field over the last 25 years. But removing the endogenous um, early and late genes, rep and cap, allows one to, to substitute a control element and a therapeutic gene, and this is what constitutes a recombinant AV cassette uh, that is propagated within a plasmid DNA. Um, the manufacturing of that in the, in the triple transfection system requires a um, 
cisplasmid or the PTR plasmid containing the ITR, so the only required cis elements for AV replication and packaging, the AV accessory functions, the rep and cap genes, and the uh, accessory functions from adenovirus. And in some cases, these can also be from other known helper viruses of, a of AV, such as uh, herpes simplex virus. But in the three plasmid system, those three elements are combined uh, and, um, and transfected into cell cells by a variety of means um, to provide those functions in trans, so rep and cap, and the accessory functions serve to replicate the AV genome where it's rescued from the plasma DNA. Um, those uh, inverted terminal repeats, which I'll discuss, are the principal signals for packaging. Uh, the capsid genes actually self-assemble, and the timing of all these events is what influences the proportion of AAV capsids that are assembled that have AAV genomes in them. So um, Ken Burns, who was really the pioneer of, of understanding the molecular basis of these events, um, just uh, wrote an article last year on human gene therapy, really uh, calling light to the fact that although this um, aspect of AV biology has been known for over 40 years, there's still a lot that's unknown. And uh, a key, key factors that uh, have led us to understand this are some improvements in technology, under, you know, because in the beginning, this uh, 125 base pair palindromic region um, was mapped through conventional um, sequencing, maximum Gilbert sequencing, and then transcripto mapping of the whole virus. Um, the axis of symmetry of this palindrome is you see that between the B prime and C prime regions, this adenine nucleotide is the axis of symmetry, and, um, and the only part that is not palindromic is the D region, which is, is critically important for priming of, of, and replication. And in fact, D region deletions um, can be used to generate uh, one defective ITR that folds back on itself and doesn't resolve the uh, terminal resolution site and can result in self complementary vectors. So here's, here's a uh, schematic of how that um, palindromic sequence is situated within a plasma DNA that's used to manufacture AAV. And um, importantly, these plasmids are carried within host bacteria. And many um, repeated sequences are susceptible to bacterial recombinate. And so now there are a variety of uh, cell lines that um, are used to um, produce a, the plasmids. And I'm going to focus on how uh, those influence the outcomes of um, manufacturing of AV plasma. So this just shows you the line of symmetry and how these uh, are, are aligned within the AV genome plasma. So um, many bacterial strains uh, that are uh, used in, in this endeavor to, to make AV plasma, um, these are some of which can be further engineered uh, to influence their uh, antibiotic resistance. And as um, uh, the one feature that I think has come from regulatory guidance is to avoid the use of beta-lactamase antibiotics in manufacturing because of the risk of penicillin allergy and the need to show that those components of the manufacturing process are not carried through to the final product. So there's been a big focus on canamycin, use of canamycin, and I'll just describe how um, many of the laboratory-based experiments that were in preclinical work, and plasmids were made using a SHORE2 cell line. You can see that it has itself canamycin resistance, which doesn't allow uh, it to be used for canamycin only um, um, uh, selection of plasmid. So uh, this is an important important part and having these uh, uh, Rec B, Rec J, and Rec C mutations in the SURE2 plasmid has been very helpful in all of the non-clinical work that was done over the past 15 years to establish a uh, vector plasmid. Um, and then how are they characterized? And so I'm going to emphasize, you know, a couple of techniques. 
um, th this paper by Tran uh, and the additional uh, publication by Tai et al. Uh, in, in, in 2018 helped describe um, and, and show how uh, single molecule real-time sequencing or smart sequencing can be used to analyze the population of AAV genomes. And uh, it's important to emphasize that when the viral uh, template is replicated, the single-stranded template is replicated through this, this strand displacement activity or rolling circle replication, the uh, product is a population of plus and minus AV strands. Um, this is not commonly discussed in the field. It's important to understand this aspect, though, because those plus and minus strands at, at appropriate doses can self-anneal and influence the, the timeline or the time, the time course of transcriptional activation following AV entry into a eukaryotic cell. But um, the findings they had from um, using smart sequencing in AV vector uh, population is that you can see a circumstance where the full length AV2 ITR is shown uh, in the D, um, panel D and compared to the right hand side of panel D where there's a truncation uh, in, the, in one of the loop structures of the ITR. This affects the proportion um, of genomes that are plus and or minus strands, and then, of course, the packaging efficiency. So what we're obviously concerned about uh, getting the most out of a, um, of a plasma preparation that's used to manufacture AV that is properly packaged and um, doesn't have these truncations. So aside from resorting to smart sequencing, how else can one assess the integrity of the IG? Charge, and this is what um, was referred to earlier about pre-banking of plasmids that are used for, for clinical manufacturing. Um, we rely on the uh, utility of the AV uh, ITR, the, these two small one sites, and uh, in blue, the AHD1 site are uh, shown in the upper portion and in the exact nucleotide sequence here. But missing one small one site can, may not be detected on an agro cell, and I'll just show you an example of how, um, how that plays out and whether you can benefit from doing additional digest in assessing plasmid integrity. So here's, for example, my favorite construct. Uh, it has two small sites in the left-hand ITR and two small sites in the right-hand ITR and one AHD1 site in a uh, in each ITR and between um, and right near this origin of replication between this antibiotic resistance region. Um, so if we uh, imagine the theoretical gel that comes from this, uh, shown in lane one is the supercoiled version of this plasma, so undigested. And it, with the proper small digestion, you see we basically cut this construct in half these small 11 base pair regions that between these uh, uh, small sites are usually not seen on this uh, side gel. Um, but uh, I can delete one uh, small site within one of the ITRs, as shown in lane three, and still have the proper restriction pattern. This is where sequencing, um, whether it's Sanger sequencing or smart sequencing, comes into play to detect the proportion of molecules that uh, have a deletion. If you delete two small sites in one of the ITRs in lane four, you see that it just now, the plasmid is linearized at the right-hand ITR. Um, and that would look uh, very much like a very large deletion in the ITR. If we look at the AHD1 digest, supercoiled in lane six, the proper pattern in lane seven, but here's um, one small site deleted in lane eight, and even two small sites deleted in lane nine, and that AHD1 site actually is the, um, it has within it the axis of symmetry at nucleotide 63 in the, in the ITR. So you can see only when there's a large deletion does the AHD1 digest come into play. So it's important to use the combination of both these techniques to, um, to identify any deletions in the ITR and or resort to sequencing. Um, here are some proposed uh, solutions to, gate, to, to improve ITR stability. 
Um, first of all, I think it's important to, to note that when um, we didn't have uh, the best uh, bacterial cell lines that recombinase deficient, it wasn't even possible to synthesize these ITRs, which now uh, DNA synthesis is so straightforward uh, and inexpensive. We've uh, recently found that we can actually make parent vectors that can be ITR sequenced, which have multiple cloning sites and, uh, and some space to region, in this case, just a polyvalylation signal. And these are actually stable carried in plasmids with um, appropriate recombinase deficient bacterial cell lines. And then one can have a very um, uh, straightforward way of determining the quality of the parent DNA and insert uh, your genes of interest into the multiple cloning site in a very modular fashion. Um, we've also taken advantage of the fact that the SURE 2 cells um, have a very favorable recombinase profile. And um, for now, using ampicillin, to select those initial clones because it's, again, important to emphasize that the clones within a single bacterium can be hundreds of plasmid molecules. If a proportion of those have a deletion in the ITR, as those cells are propagated, any of those that have a growth advantage will take uh, become the majority of the population. Once a clone's identified with a single restriction and uh, cutting, you can delete this whole region and rely uh, merely on the nomice and canamice instead. And then this, um, this design also allows for uh, a producer cell line to be made by selecting using the same open reading frame uh, that is canamycin resistant uh, is neomycin resistance in eukaryotic cells. So that gives you um, some idea of how to use both restriction plasmid, restriction digestion to analyze clones um, understanding which proportion of clones have deletions and um, propagate, propagate, propagate these under, um, under improved conditions for stability, either uh, using, for example, the single-stranded binding protein of E. coli seems to stabilize ITRs or these favorable um, recombinase deficient cell lines. So I'll, um, I'll you know, hand, hand it off uh, now to Christine, who will go on to the next section. Uh, the presentation. Okay, thank you, Barry. I'm Christine Schaefer, and I'm really happy to be here to share some of my experience in gene therapy with this group today. I've been at Spark since 2018, and I was lucky to join the company just after Lux Turner was approved for the U.S., and then just before it was approved in Europe. So the time I joined was a pretty pivotal time for the company. And um, since then, we've pretty much been in a steady state of production of Luxturna. Um, it's not often that I get to tell the story of the first gene therapy approved in both the EU and the US. But since we've been in production for about four years, we've certainly learned some things along the way. Before I get into some lessons learned, I just want to tell you a little bit of information about Spark. The Spark is a leader in gene therapy. We are located in Philadelphia, which is a hub of cell and gene therapy. So people are calling it Silicon Valley these days. But it's not really much of a valley. Um, we are a member of the Roche Group, and we have just surpassed 700 employees, which really represents a doubling since the time I joined about four years ago. We currently have one approved product, which is Luxterna. We have three assets in the clinic, and we have five in preclinical programs. And all of Spark's gene therapy processes are based on an AAV platform. So one of the reasons that I joined Spark was because I saw the incredible potential that gene therapy has for the quality of life for people suffering from genetic disease. And one of the most amazing things about gene therapy is it really has the potential to offer cures where currently there isn't a cure available. So Luxterna is Spark's approved gene therapy. And this product is used to help restore eyesight to people who are going blind from a rare retinal disease. On average, people who have this disease go completely blind by the time they're 
by the time they're 42 years old. So imagine as a young person, you are diagnosed with this genetic disease and you're living every day knowing that at some point in your adulthood, you're gonna be completely blind. Lexterna has the ability to change that. So Lexterna will help restore eyesight. And it's pretty incredible. I remember after the first time that uh, I got to hear a patient testimonial after I started at Spark. And it was a young woman who told a story about after receiving Lux Turner uh, and her eyesight had improved significantly, she saw snow for the first time. And it kind of hit me at that moment that this is really how incredible gene therapy can be. And this is what a great product Lux Turner is. I never really thought about what it would be like to see snow for the first time because I've been seeing it all my life. But imagine somebody who knows the word snow. They know what it feels like, but they've never seen a snowflake or they've never seen a snow-covered landscape. So just seeing the impact that Lux Turner has on, on patients is just, it's just been incredible. So today I'm gonna to share with you some lessons learned since I've been working at Spark and working on Lux Turner for the past couple of years. I'm gonna focus in three areas. This first one is really about investing. So if we think about traditional biotechnology processes, think about monoclonal antibodies, they've been around for almost 50 years, and as a result, the processes are scaled up, they're very well developed, cell lines are well understood and well characterized. Gene therapy, especially early gene therapy, is different. So I'm looking at Luxterna, it's a very small scale process. Uh, often these early processes are laboratory processes where the laboratory process and equipment are adopted into the manufacturing setting. This is the result of several factors, including the use of non-optimized or let's say not yet optimized cell lines and lack of process history and experience. And at the time for Luxterna, there were fewer options for what I would consider production grade small scale equipment. Um, that's changing now, but it's, it's taken some time. So the learnings from this one are really try to use contemporary equipment and processes from the start. This will help you provide a sustainable and consistent process yield, and it'll also help you out with cycle times. So if, you, if you're using an adherent soul culture, uh, look at using high density fixed bed bioreactor instead of roller bottles or cell stacks. If you're using a suspension cell culture, look at using perfusion. You could also try to work perfusion into a high density fixed bioreactor system. These will improve your uh, yield and cycle time. And then in your purification process, are you using say, kind of old school methods like gradient centrifugation for separation? If you are, consider looking at replacing that with a, some kind of chromatography. So if you invest early in contemporary equipment and processes, this will set you up for later success in manufacturing settings. All right, so let's talk about automation. So here's where you can find opportunities to enhance your process control and effectively reduce human error. It'll also improve your process efficiency and ease of data acquisition. Well, let's turn a manufacturing process as a highly manual process. And at the time it was developed, we didn't really have the benefit of building in automation at the beginning. And as you all know, trying to make changes, big changes after licensure, has to be well-planned and it can be difficult and lengthy and costly. So in hindsight, if we had embedded some automation infrastructure from the beginning, it would have been optimal even if we hadn't used the full automation from the start. But once you have the technology in place, it's quite feasible to expand on it over time as you gain process experience. So how do we do this? So it doesn't even have to start big. You can start with automation at the equipment level and you can look at how you obtain cell density. So are you doing this manually with a microscope and a cell counter? 
Or can you get an automated cell counter? Or do you have an option of some kind of inline density measurement? Do you look at your chromatography steps? Use a system that can run off a recipe and automate your product solution so that you don't have to rely on your manufacturing operators collecting your product by um, basically manually. And then use any kind of inline monitoring and smart equipment you can from the start. And think about how you can integrate that equipment from the beginning. One other thing I wanted to mention here is data integrity. When Luxterno was in development and first approved, data integrity was just starting to become a focus. But now there's a huge industry focus on it. And this is something that needs to be considered as you start your automation journey. So when you're looking at automated systems and software, make sure that what you're looking at is compliant from a data integrity perspective. And when you develop your procedures around your automation, build in data integrity to your procedures, procedures from the start. And where you can enable the data integrity features, so individual user logins, electronic signatures, et cetera, use those from the start where you can. Doing this from the beginning will help you mitigate having to go through a large data integrity remediation effort at a later date. The take home message here is you wanna develop an automation roadmap and plan this from the beginning and put in some infrastructure. Even if you don't fully utilize all of the automation from the beginning, you can definitely build on it over time. And automation will improve your process control, efficiency, and compliance, all of which will enable your ability to manufacture consistently in the future. And the third and final topic I want to talk about is scaling out or scaling up. The strategy is about making choices, and that definitely holds true when it comes to scaling an AAV gene therapy process. With an AAV gene therapy, you have to make a choice in terms of scaling out or scaling up. In most cases, you can't do both because of the impact that it'll have on your process design, and then ultimately your equipment selection and manufacturing facility design. This is probably more critical to startup companies than established companies that have big manufacturing facilities. If you look at traditional adherent processes using roller bottles or cell stacks, these are really manual processes. They require extensive operator handling. They're time consuming and they often result in process variability. Scaling a batch of adherent cell culture like this is really limited to incubator facility space and your personnel. With suspension bioreactors or adherent fixed bed bioreactors, these can be scaled larger than traditional adherent cell cultures, and this equipment is available right now. It's tricky because companies have to work on development of cell lines, cell culture media, and then transfection processes that can produce sufficient yield as the process is scaled up. Because of this lack of optimization, cell growth and delivery of the transfection solution to the cells is becoming more difficult as the scale increases. So when you develop a, a strategy, you have to determine how you can scale up or scale out to meet the quantity of product that you need to support the target patient population. And that, that may drive your decision on how you're going to do that. So when you go into your gene therapy development, you need to determine what that scaling strategy is going to be at the outset. If the cell culture can't be scaled up, consider scaling out. Scale up, of course, is optimal. You get economy of scale. And you can just maximize your bioreactor scale. And then the purification equipment at a larger scale is available currently. <clears throat> if I look at Luxterna, Luxterna is a small scale roller bottle process, and it's been scaled out to produce several purified sublots that are combined to make a batch of drug substance. While this strategy works for Luxterna, this isn't going to be something that's going to work for other gene therapy products that may require larger volumes for patient dosing. 
or products where your patient population is relatively large. Um, with this option, however, if you have proper stability data, you could use it to tailor batch size according to demand, which could be useful in low volume or rare disease products. Another option is to scale up to your largest bioreactor size that you can get, get sufficient yield, and then run your batch so that you harvest your cell culture from the bioreactor and take it through your first product concentration step. Once you get through that volume reduction, you can store that product for further manufacture at a later date. This allows you to bank several product intermediate batches, pool them at a later date, and process them as a larger batch over a larger purification train. This is really useful where you need high throughput or where you're trying to maximize the time in your production suite, particularly in cell culture. And then one other option is to scale up to your largest bioreactor and then run bioreactors in parallel. You can then harvest those bioreactors in parallel, pool the harvested material, and then process them over a single larger scale purification train. So this one allows you to scale up your purification process and equipment and reduce your cycle time for batch by maximizing your starting cell culture volume when you're limited to a certain volume of bioreactor. The bottom line here is you need to develop that strategy early and you need to develop a process that can be sustained once you hit commercial manufacturing. If the process you take into production can't be sustained, you'll run into a host of issues that will hinder your ability to consistently and reliably manufacture your gene therapy product. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, and with that, we're actually going to move on to the Q&A. Please note that there is still time to submit your questions using the Q&A tab to the left of your screen. We have lots of great questions already and we'll try to get to as many as possible. So our first question is actually for Christine. At what point in process development do I need to know what kind of equipment to use in manufacturing? Christine, are you there? Okay, well, let's actually move on to our second question, which is for Cindy. When moving from research use only up through clinical trials, how do I know what quality level is acceptable at each stage? Um, that's a great question. I think, you know, it, there is no one-size-fits-all fit, answer to that. Um, what I can share is that, you know, Aldebron does have extensive experience supporting all phases of development. So I guess depending upon the product and end application and maybe the proximity to the patient, we can certainly share our experiences and knowledge regarding, like, phase-appropriate services that we offer. Um, we definitely would value the transparency associated with um, inviting our clients to, or their consultants, of course, to come to our facility and audit our, our services. Um, of course, that would give them a deep dive into the quality systems and what GMP source and GMP services offer. And then, you know, those dialogues accordingly with what would be appropriate for clinical phase and beyond manufacturing. Great. Thanks so much, Cindy. So it looks like we actually have Christine back on the line with us. Um, so Christine, to reiterate my previous question, um, at what point in process development do I need to know what kind of equipment to use in manufacturing? Thanks, Ross. Um, that's a great question and uh, maybe not a straightforward answer, but you really need to have an idea of where you want to eventually get to. So um, first is determining whether you're going to take forward an adherent or a suspension cell culture process. And then from there, you can start looking at the type of equipment. So 
is it a chromatography system? Is it a, a bioreactor? Are you going to look at a third tank versus a rocking bioreactor? So in, in some ways, you want to decide this really early on in PD just to have an initial pathway for where you're headed. But there's going to be some flexibility in early PD. It's when you get to your you're starting to get to your later stage clinical process and your scale up that you really need to decide on the type of equipment. But you want to start thinking about that when your process is still in development. Got it. Thanks so much, Christine. So our, this is actually going to be our final question. Um, we had lots of great questions today and couldn't get to them all, but we will try our best to get back to everyone who submitted personally after the webinar. So our final question is actually for Christine again, and it's a really good one. Um, I'm with a gene therapy startup company. As a small company, how do I even start thinking about bringing on automation? That's another great question. Um, this is something where you really just have to look at what you want to start with. And if you're a small company, you don't have the internal resources for this, look at, look at bringing in a consultant who can help you put together a roadmap or a consulting company. There are firms out there that can help you start to put together a plan. They can also introduce you to different aspects of automation and work on even building a modular plan for this. So um, typically, in my experience in startup companies, you don't have this expertise in-house. So you're going to want to bring somebody in who does have that expertise. So if it's not somebody you have internal, look at using a consultant. Great. Thanks so much. So we actually have a couple more questions as well. Um, that just came in. So our next question is actually for Cindy. Can you explain services or benefits your regulatory team provides? Sure. Um, I think that one almost relates back to the previous question in the sense that, you know, our, our regulatory team can certainly support helping clients um, understand based on their experience what and you know appropriate guidance of course what would be an appropriate service level um, that can be offered for you know phase of clinical trial and end application um, i would also say that drug master files that um, our organization has has submitted could be cross-referenced and certainly um, improve you know speed to market and, and filing prep time um, our dedicated teams, they could also write part of or all of a filing, which would allow clients to focus more on their research priorities. And maybe lastly, as a, a CDMO, our regulatory team does have extensive experience with different health authorities, which really, I guess, translates to a right first time and streamlined approach to compliance. Um, I guess this has been proven to be true based on our own filings and experience. So those are those are just a few, I guess, of the services and benefits of, of us having this team built out. Great. Thanks so much. And we actually have even more questions that have just started coming in. So our following question is for either Cindy or Barry. Um, have you found any best practices in plasmid production or construct design to reduce mixed species populations in ITR bearing plasmids? Yeah, I can I can take that one. Um, so, as I as I described, there are populations of plasmids within a single clone. So um, that process of screening clones for the um, features that are desirable. In general, we make a cutoff of so that at least 85% of the product needs to have the fully intact ITRs. Um, obviously, you wouldn't have to adjust for that if there were nearly 100% of the of the material were intact ITRs. So that that's really just a matter of, of providing an estimate through this 
small digestion and or uh, in some plasmids, we've now incorporated unique eight base pair um, recognition sequences just outside and inside the ITRs uh, that help diagnose whether the right or left-hand ITR has acquired a mutation. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Barry. So our next question is, again, um, a startup question, um, and this one's actually for Christine. For a startup company, how do you weigh the advantages and disadvantages of taking an adherent roller bottle cell culture process forward into the manufacturing plan? Surely there might be advantages to support a roller bottle process. So I would say you're really going to have to carefully consider what advantage you're getting out of that. And, and honestly, one of the only advantages I see is speed of getting that process into manufacturing because roller bottle processes have been around for such a long time. I would say that I wouldn't recommend it if you can start working on development to get a better output from, if you're going to stick with an adherent cell line, a, um, you go with a bioreactor because you're going to have better control. The, the problem with the roller bottle processes is, is that they are so manual. And yes, I know companies have automated this, but I, I think that your money would be better spent working with a bioreactor and moving towards that rather than staying with roller bottles. Um, it might work for, again, a small volume product, something like in the rare disease field. But from a manufacturing perspective, it's just going to give you a lot of variation. It, it's going to be very manual. And it's hard to sustain that kind of manufacturing process in a continuous manner. It's hard to sustain once you're in the manufacturing setting. So you'd really have to carefully way what advantages you might get out of that compared to having a better controlled, sustainable process in your manufacturing setting. Yeah, it, this is uh, Barry, I can add to that. So, you know, over the past 15 years, we've uh, had uh, 11 investigator initiated INDs that were um, developed on an inherent cell line because that's what existed in the very beginning of time. And, um, and now we've completely abandoned any adherent manufacturing, even for uh, small-scale proof-of-concept studies, because the, um, the consistency of the suspension cell line and the methods uh, and the reagents used for suspension transfection have improved sufficiently that even if it's a 50 mil culture uh, and what might have been done in a flask previously um, can uh, can can help predict what yield would be at, at larger scale and scales uh, pretty reasonably. Of course, as was mentioned earlier, once you get beyond 200 liters, there's a lot of a variability that has to be addressed in, in process development for, um, for the reagents that are used to, to, uh, to load plasmids into the cells. Great. Thanks so much, Barry and Christine. So this next question will actually be our final question. Um, again, we have a lot of great questions today and couldn't get to them all, but we will try our best to get back to everyone who submitted personally after the webinar. So our next question is for either of you three, and it is, can you elaborate on plasmid purification? What are the main bottlenecks? Sure, this is Cindy. I'd be happy to take that, that question. Um, as far as elaborating on plasmid purification, I can say that, you know, Aldebaran at least has multiple methods for purification, whether that would be, um, you know, resin-based bed chromatography or membrane technologies. Um, as far as bottlenecks are concerned, the, the purification process, regardless of, you know, the surface level, generally is quite quick. It, it really is the upstream fermentation process moving um, very directly into a downstream purification approach. And because we've built out our capacity at multiple scales, there's, there's just generally not 
a bottleneck associated with the purification or um, any significant hold times between different unit operations. Um, however, you know, if you were looking at bottlenecks, you could consider um, potentially some of the, the challenges being on the back end of the purification and fill where you have to go into the testing process. And of course, at a GMP source or GMP grade level, you're looking at um, also the the overarching um, review of all documentation and ensuring that um, you know there weren't quality events or other situations that need to be addressed prior to the potential for release. But as far as the quality control testing, some of the assays that would be you know required or utilized would be based on a you know culture or time approach where it could be you know, several weeks of time that's just inherent with the assay itself. And so that could be considered a bottleneck. Um, going back to the previous question as far as, you know, best practice for ITR stability in plasmid, I know that over the years, Aldebron has really refined our screening approach as well as um, determining, you know, best clone and, and utilizing what we call a pre-bank process prior to generating a very suitable um, cell bank that would be used or master cell bank used in, in manufacturing. And so while that could be looked at as a potential bottleneck on the front end, it's certainly well worth the investment. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that insightful answer. And with that, thanks to all of you for attending this fierce biotech webinar and submitting so many great questions. I'd like to personally thank our speakers for participating and Eldev and Eldevron for presenting today's webinar. Please note that this webinar has been recorded. You will be able to access the recording within 24 hours using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Thank you again for joining, and we look forward to seeing you at future events.